me a personal pleasure to introduce Colin Koopman, who is going to talk about an analytics of conduct toward actionistic pragmatism and genealogy. Indeed, we have today the occasion to learn and discuss with him what can be considered his own philosophical proposal, a renewal of pragmatism beyond the experience op option referring to Dewey and the linguistic turn referring to Brandon, based, as Colin wrote, <clears throat> on the category of action or better of con conduct. Kupma fields of research are based from politics, ethics, and technology to genealogical philosophy with a special reference to Foucault and pragmatism from James and Dewey to Rorty. He is currently professor of philosophy, head of philosophy and director of new media and culture at the University of Oregon, US. His books include Pragmatism as Transition, Historicity, and Hope in James, Dewey, and Rorty for Columbia University Press. Genealogy as Critique, Foucault, and the Problems of Modernity, and How We Became Our Data, a Genealogy of the Informational Person. He also published many articles in scholarly journals, ranging from critical inquiry to contemporary pragmatism to constellation. Besides, his writings have appeared also in the New York Times and Aeon. Please, Colin, it's a pleasure for us to hear you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here from across the globe, or at least some, um, some parts of it. And um, thank you, especially to Rosella and everyone there in Milan who helped organize this and for the invitation. Um, as many of you know, this was originally intended to be an in-person gathering and conference. Um, and I would much rather be, um, I know it's late there for you all, I'd much rather be winding up the conference day, heading for a glass of wine or um, something lovely like that, rather than staring out of my window into the fog right now. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, we prevail onward, onward we march. So um, it's great that we have this option um, in the work of, in the context of my work on data that Rosella mentioned, I often wonder how different this pandemic would look if we didn't have the internet in the way that we have it right now. And um, not just the absence of these kinds of screens, but the, the entire response would have been different, which sort of shows a point about the mediation of action in technologies today. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that's something that you all have been thinking about in your own ways. I just, I mentioned that at, at the outset, um, not because I have any detailed insight into pandemic policy, um, but rather um, it's maybe a nice vignette to think about kind of the broader project that I wanna talk about today, which is, thinking through um, and approaching social theory and political philosophy primarily from the lens of um, action or conduct or practice, um, taking that term from the heading for this series of talks in this seminar. Um, how is it that our practices, how is it that our actions and conducts are conditioned by technology and of course by much else um, in the context of something like um, an outbreak of um, an infectious disease spreading across the globe with startling rapidity. Um, and so let me um, try to offer in much more philosophical detail some motivation for that perspective of looking at the social and the political, and I would also add the epistemological, though my own primary um, philosophical focus is in political philosophy, looking at those through the lens of conduct or action. So I, I wanna use pragmatism to motivate that a little bit today. Um, I wanna situate that um, in the history of pragmatism and then situate it within the history of some debates in pragmatism. Um, that all of you will be familiar with in different ways. Um, and then um, I'll turn to 
thinking through some consequences or um, better yet um, ramifications for how we might conduct political inquiry, how we might see the work of political philosophy specifically through that conduct lens. Um, and I'll, in that last part, I'll have occasion to turn to the work of somebody else with whom I find the emphasis on action and pragmatism quite resonant, and that's uh, the work of Michel Foucault, um, who I think is also primarily a thinker of practices above all else. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Um, by the way, I hear my kids screaming in the background. If they, if, if you hear anything, I guarantee, I promise they're okay. Um, it's, as any of you who have kids know, they just will scream. Um, it's fine. Um, so don't be startled by that. Um, let's see here. All right. Okay. So I'm assuming everybody can see this. Prezi share. Okay. Um, by the way, I think you all have options on your end. If you want to see just the um, the slides, you can see that, or you can, um, I think in your top right corner, there are buttons you can click if you want to see my face side by side with the slides or other people's face side by side with the slides. So I'll let you all kind of choose your preferred view as you will. Um, so let me um, jump into things here. Um, there we go, I'm gonna clear the mask. So I'm just going to kind of start, I'm, I'm, as you see, I have this, um, I'll kind of operate with a visual metaphor of a tree here. Um, so let me start with the roots in, um, in the text, in um, what we find in the writings of um, many of the great pragmatists. And I'm going to primarily focus on James here, um, but let me turn first just briefly to a few other pragmatists in whom we find, again, what I'm looking for in this first part of the talk is motivation for taking seriously the centrality of conduct or action to pragmatism. Um, and just, you know, one quick way to think about that is the very term itself, the Greek term pragma, um, connoting um, deed or thing done, um, you know, that would sort of suggest to somebody who's just sort of just coming along to pragmatism as it were, um, wide-eyed and, um, you know, hadn't sort of done serious philosophical study of pragmatism would think, well, this is going to be a philosophy of action. This is going to be a philosophy of conduct. Um, and that's really, again, and I'll get into the reasons why, that's, that's what I want to take seriously or most seriously in pragmatism, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, histories of experience pragmatism and linguistic turn pragmatism. Um, but let me get into that argument in a second. First, let me just offer some, again, just brief textual motivation to, to start things. Um, so I'll just turn to James, Peirce, Mead, and Rorty very quickly. Um, there's no um, um, argument here and that Dewey is not on this list. Of course, we could add Dewey here, um, but let me just start with these figures. Um, and I'm just gonna offer just a few quick quotes just so you all have a sense of the flavor of what I'm talking about. Um, so from Rorty, we find um, an emphasis on um, action in throughout his work, but you know, one of the places that it shows up most interestingly is in his 1979 book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, um, where he advocates for a view that he calls epistemological behaviorism, um, which is a term that's not really current in the literature today, um, in part because Brody himself sort of let go of the term. I think behaviorism came to have um, connotations that Rorty didn't want it to have. I mean, he had primarily, I think, sort of associated it with Quine in a way where the connotations aren't kind of Skinnerian stimulus reflex kind of conception. Um, but what Rorty is really thinking about there is a perspective where we take people's behaviors or what they do or their actions as the lens through which to understand epistemology or the lens with which to understand knowledge. Um, a little bit later, three years later in Consequences of Pragmatism, um, his collection, he writes, it is the vocabulary of practice rather than that of theory of action rather than contemplation. Um, perhaps a brief nod on the side there to Arendt, I'm not sure, in which one can say something useful about truth. So the vocabulary of practice rather than theory, action rather than contemplation. Um, of course, notice that Rorty frames that in terms of his own meta concept of vocabularies, which signals that he's really ultimately a linguistic pragmatist, um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, Sort of going further back again, this is an incomplete list. If we're at more complete, you know, between um, Mead and Rorty, we'd certainly place somebody like Quine. Um, 
but Mead and his um, fantastic movements of thought in the 19th century um, writes um, amongst, you know, just again, plucking just kind of quotes, not quite at random here, but um, just one quote of many, the structure of experience itself depends on what we are going to do. Um, so Mead is firmly there locating the experience pragmatism of his day within the orbit um, of, of action, of what we're going to do. Doings are what determine what we experience. Um, doings are what condition the possibilities for our experience. Um, let me go further back now to the beginnings of pragmatism in Peirce. Um, there's a lot more to say about um, Peirce and James and uh, their, sh um, their shared perspective over um, the priority of conduct in pragmatism, but also their debates on it. Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of preview that a little bit, but maybe that's something we can come back to later in discussion if people uh, want to discuss. Um, but just sort of start here, start with with Peirce in 1878, how to make our ideas clear, um, where he offers this methodological rule, consider what effects which might conceivably have practical bearings we conceive the object of our conception to have. Then our conception of these effects is the whole of our conception of the object. So of course, this is Peirce's pragmatism and the, the actionistic quintessence of Peirce's pragmatism is the emphasis here on practical bearings. Um, which uh, earlier in the essay, he um, had stated in terms of, um, again, quoting Peirce, the whole function of thought is to produce habits of action. The whole function of thought is to produce habits of action. So this is Peirce in 1878. Um, James, of course, would pick this up and run with it as the principle of pragmatism. He would write to develop a thought's meaning. This is in 1898. Um, to develop a thought's meaning, we need to only determine what conduct it is fitted to produce. That conduct is for us its sole significance. Um, so um, this, of course, as is well known to uh, many of you here, and certainly those of you in, in Rosella Seminar, uh, gave Peirce much pause. Um, four years later, um, Peirce was tasked with writing the entry on pragmatism for Baldwin's uh, Century Dictionary. This is 1902. And Peirce there writes, um, um, in a kind of characteristic, um, his, his sort of a characteristic Percian style when he's engaging in criticism of James, you know, of course they had much to disagree on, um, but I think there was also a deep shared friendship between them. Um, their, you know, such that their correspondence, as you read through it, it it's actually, um, I think, filled with a number of inside jokes between the two. Um, and here, I find this passage quite funny in ways. So Peirce writes in 1902, this, of course, is not from correspondence, from, but from a publication um, on pragmatism, titled Pragmatism. In 1896, Peirce writes, William James published his will to believe, and later his philosophical conceptions and practical results. So that's the one I just quoted from which pushed this method of pragmatism to such extremes as must tend to give us pause. The doctrine appears to assume that the end of man is action, a stoical, act a stoical axiom which, um, and now, uh, now here comes Percy's joke, to the present writer at the age of 60 does not recommend itself so forcibly as it did at 30. Um, so Percy, of course, is admitting that 30, you know, 20, 30 years prior, he was advocating more for um, this conception of action as the center of pragmatism. Um, if it be admitted on the contrary that action wants an end and that that end must be something of a general description, then the spirit of the maxim itself, which is that we must look to the upshot of our concepts in order to rightly to apprehend them, would direct us towards something different from practical facts, namely to general ideas as the true interpreters of our thought. Um, so Peirce by 1902, um, is moving more towards a pragmatism that emphasizes thought and rationality over conduct. Um, and that gives us kind of a way into some of the history of the debates that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but let me just um, continue this brief um, um, motivating um, dive into just some of these, these texts just to get a sense of, um, again, what I have in mind here and how I'm trying to motivate this. Um, and you know, the, the broader project that this is a part of is one in which I'm trying to offer both um, historically and um, theoretically a, an argument that the best option for pragmatism today is what I call conduct pragmatism or pragmatism that takes seriously 
conduct as the center, it takes seriously pragma as the center of pragmatism. Um, and from my reading and analysis, um, my sense is and has been for a number of years now that really the best place to go to motivate that is James, um, especially the early James, um, which is who I have a picture of um, here. This is um, James um, on his expedition up the Amazon um, as, as a young man. Um, and um, so when I say the early James, and this is again, something we can discuss later, I basically, you know, I'm thinking James up until um, he dives into religion. So James up until 1898, and there's this kind of big shift in James in 1898, where he goes all in for a pluralistic metaphysics and what he calls radical empiricism. Um, I think there's a different conception of pragmatism operative in James's early work, Principles of Psychology and most of the Will to Believe essays. Um, and that's a pragmatism that really does put practice or action, or again, the term for James in, in any 19th century writer in English is going to be conduct. Um, so let me just give three examples of this in James's work, um, following along here with the, the slides. Um, so Will to Believe, 1896, James emphasizes the importance of action in overcoming the dread of indecision. Um, you know, the will to believe is all about incapacities for decision, but it's really about incapacities for action. Um, it's about the debilitations of action. Um, and James there boldly says that belief is measured by action. Belief is measured by action. So this, this clearly um, uh, um, anticipates Rorty's epistemological behaviorism, um, as well as much of Klein. Um, so um, again, I'm just offering an overview here. There's a lot more we could do to dig into the details of these um, individual quotes. Um, um, from a few years prior to that, um, James's What the Will Affects essay, um, which was a preview of some of the material that would show up in the Will chapter of Principles of Psychology in 1890. Um, and in this, amongst many other texts of the time, we find um, James emphasizing, again, the central importance of acting. And um, so what James says here is, the thinking and feeling portions of our life seem little more than halfway houses toward behavior. Um, and this is a theme that, again, appears again and again in this time. And it relies on a kind of tripartite faculty psychology, which James just sort of is, is the kind of psychological vernacular of the time. Um, where um, James sees psychology as dividing, um, not just James, James and, and nearly everybody else writing at the time, and this is um, surely an, in part a Kantian inheritance, sees, every, sees, sees the human as divided between the thinking portion, the feeling portion, and the acting or conducting portion. Um, so um, we, we reason or we think, we feel and we sense, um, and we will or we behave, right? So these are sort of the three dimensions of the self, as it were, for with which James is operating in late 19th century psychology. Um, and here he's saying clearly that, well, two of these portions are just halfway houses toward, toward one. Um, so prioritizing behaving, action, willing. Um, and this is even more clear in um, a fantastic little essay that doesn't get a lot of attention, but James's 1881 reflex action in theism. In part, this doesn't get a lot of attention today because it's in some ways framed as an argument about God um, and it's a kind of theological argument. But um, there's a lot going on here that I think um, speaks to really what I'm trying to dig out of James or what I'm trying to sort of motivate through James. Um, and again, there's this triadic conception of the self that I just mentioned. Um, it's the self for James is a triad, neither of whose elements has any independent existence. So there's an interdependency for James here of will, sensibility, and thought. Um, but nevertheless, James, you know, James, I think, rightly bites the philosophical bullet. I mean, pragmatists are known for um, anti-dualisms, um, but, you know, pragmatists are not anti-distinction. And where we're willing to make distinctions, we need to, I think, engage the difficult philosophical task of um, being willing to state where the priority lies. Um, and that may be contextual at times, you know, priorities may shift, um, but it's so, you know, I think James recognizes in the background here, it's not just enough to say that the self is a triad whose willing nature, sensible nature and thinking nature are interwoven, um, but what takes priority? What sort of, what's, what takes default priority for James? And James is clear. Um, it's the will, the willing department of our nature, in short, 
dominates both the conceiving department and the feeling department. Or in plainer English, perception and thinking are only there for behavior's sake. Perception and thinking are only there for behavior's sake. Transformation is affected in the interest of our volitional nature and for no other purpose whatsoever. So this is James in 1881, three years after Peirce's How to Make Our Ideas Clear. James would later eventually reformulate this as the principle of pragmatism and attribute it to Peirce and Peirce got, um, you know, Peirce bristled at that once James started attributing it to him. Um, and of course, you know, by then they were both 20 years older and um, in, in, insert Peirce's joke. So, um, so let me, you know, I've nodded a few times um, toward this debate in the history of pragmatism between um, different options for where pragmatism ought to place its emphasis. Um, there's a well-known tradition and rich body of work in what I will call experience pragmatism and equally well-known and rich body of work in what we can call linguistic pragmatism. And my project is an argument for conduct pragmatism as the center. And I would wanna frame this argument in exactly the same way that James frames his argument in that 1881 essay I just mentioned. In other words, we can see pragmatism as kind of a triadic philosophical methodology. So I'm, you know, I, I certainly don't want to make the argument that experience has no place in pragmatism or language has no place in pragmatism. That's, I, I don't know what it would mean to make such an argument. Rather, if we see pragmatism as this interweaving of um, willing, feeling, and thinking in the way that James situated his psychology um, and in a way that the history of pragmatism itself seems to bear out with its successive waves, then the question, again, the philosophical option that I think we have to face up to as philosophers is, well, which of these takes priority? Um, you know, I think it's, it's philosophically, it's not doing it enough to say, well, pragmatism offers us three perspectives and they're all equally wonderful. Um, no, it's valuable that pragmatism offers us three perspectives, but which of those do we really want to go to? Which of those do we really want to emphasize? Um, so, and again, my argument is following the, the early James, um, the emphasis ought to be more firmly on conduct or action or what we would be more inclined today to call, uh, to call uh, practice. Um, so I'll be quick here because I think many of you know this well. Um, and just to give a quick sense of what I mean, what I'm referring to, experience pragmatism, I think would primarily be um, associated with much in early 20th century pragmatism, especially the later James, um, again, James after 1898, James's pluralistic metaphysics and his radical empiricism, um, which are, I think, importantly related to his pragmatism, but, um, my argument would place a lot of weight on James's own observation that his radical empiricism and his pragmatism are not identical, um, that it's not the same thing. And I think we often run that together in the scholarship and take the radical empiricism to just be the pragmatism. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's, that's right um, textually. And then I think philosophically it gets us into some trouble because it pulls us away from the, those parts of James that I would emphasize. Um, another, of course, the, the, you know, the key place you're going to go to um, as an experienced pragmatist, or if you're looking to excavate the experience dimensions of pragmatism, I would think would be Dewey's Naturalistic Metaphysics of Experience, um, books like Art as Experience, um, aspects of Dewey's 1938 book, um, Logic, um, where you get a very rich experiential conception of of the self and its place and its, um, its experiencing in the world as a really sort of all encompassing philosophical vision that's very powerful um, and has much to offer. And so again, I'm not making an argument against the role of experience in pragmatism, rather what I wanna argue against is what you might call experientialism or kind of put an ism at the end and say, well, that's that's, that has everything that a pragmatism needs. The experience option has everything that a pragmatism needs. Or a sort of more modest version of that argument that I'm still committed to um, um, arguing against would be one that says that experience pragmatism is an experientialist conception of pragmatism. That's where we ought to place the priority. That's where we ought to sort of place the focus. Um, and again, I think there's much going for experience pragmatism, but I, I wanna argue the focus needs to be elsewhere. It needs to be on conduct. Um, 
I can go into in some detail if we want, um, and this is something I've written about, my concerns about where experienced pragmatism kind of um, runs ashore, it basically runs ashore on the ground of an analysis of normative phenomena. Um, and here, the kind of quickest way to make that point would be to reference somebody like Sellers or even Rorty's or Brandom's later critiques of experienced pragmatism as relying on a certain conception of experiential givens as grounding normative phenomena. Um, and I think that that story eventually kind of runs out. Um, so then historically, I mean, historically, that's the, the kind of how pragmatism itself developed. That story ran out and then pragmatists moved everything over to language. And we had the linguistic turn pragmatism associated primarily with Rorty. Um, Brandon, of course, looms large here. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier Rorty's use of the term vocabulary. I mean, this is Rorty's central philosophical concept is the concept of a vocabulary. Um, I mean, you pull that away from Rorty and you don't have anything left. Um, um, so there's this emphasis on language or our vocabularies or um, the ways in which our descriptions can determine our philosophical responses to problems. Um, in Brandom, this even comes to be associated with a kind of pragmatism that's um, really close to German idealism. Brandom's even willing to call it a rationalist pragmatism. Um, I don't think Rorty would ever have gone that far as to sort of connote pragmatism as a kind of rationalism. Um, so this is, you know, this is um, kind of the, the current in pragmatism that um, in the contemporary moment, perhaps, um, but certainly going back to the early 2000s and the 90s was sort of most prominent um, in terms of the discipline and in terms of pragmatism's reach beyond the discipline. Um, there have been many critiques of linguistic pragmatism. Um, I accept many of those critiques. I don't accept all of them, um, but I certainly accept the sort of the general um, reluctance that a number of philosophers have expressed towards linguistic turn philosophy in terms of um, its inability to come to terms with certain dimensions of our lives um, and, or as I would put it, come to terms with certain dimensions of our practices. Um, and, you know, one way to think about that is that linguistic pragmatism emphasizes the linguistically mediated nature of our practices or the linguistically mediated nature of, of our actions. And that's right, but of course, if that's right, our practices and actions aren't just mediated by language, they're mediated by so much else, they're mediated by, again, our built environment, our technology, deeply mediated by that. Um, so if we're interested in the mediations of action and practice, why don't we just talk about action and practice and start there and have that be the philosophical center of pragmatism and then draw on linguistic pragmatism or experiential pragmatism to talk about um, varying forms of mediation. Um, and that's, that's the move that I, that I wanna argue for. That's the move that I'm making a claim for. So um, let me then um, offer a kind of theoretical way of um, making the point here. Cause I don't want my argument just to be, oh, well, if you sort of chart the history of pragmatism, you start with conduct pragmatism in the early James and the early Peirce, and they both moved away, strayed from it. And then you got linguistic pragmatism, et cetera. And now we wind back at conduct pragmatism. I don't wanna make a kind of dialectical argument that like this is how the tradition sort of works itself out according to its inner rationality. Of course, that wouldn't be an argument for conduct pragmatism. That would be an argument for a more rationalist pragmatism because it would rely on a kind of inner dialectic. Um, so let me motivate it a little differently, um, which would be to draw on some of what I argued in my first book, Pragmatism is Transition, um, where I developed this um, claim that one of the distinguishing features of pragmatism as a philosophy is its emphasis on process or its emphasis on transitionality or what I call in the book transitionalism. Um, and, um, you know, one way to think about this is, you know, if you look at any, you know, any, any um, um, rightly called or deservedly called pragmatist argument or pragmatist theme, um, whatever pragmatism does there, among other things, it submits whatever debate it's entering into to the crucible of process. In other words, pragmatism 
um, teaches us to not see what we're looking at as static or fixed or eternal. Um, it teaches us to see what we're looking at as transitional, as dynamic, as processual. James famously writes, life is in the transitions. Um, and so if that kind of process kernel of pragmatism makes sense to you, again, there's a lot more we can talk about there. Um, but if that makes sense to you as it makes sense to me, then that provides us, I think, with a really strong theoretical basis for this move to conduct pragmatism, because as I have on the slide here, unlike experience and, and language, action would not even admit of static treatment. Action is essentially transitional. Now, of course, in Dewey's experience pragmatism and in um, Rorty's and especially Brandom's linguistic pragmatism, you get a dynamic or transitional conception of experience in Dewey's case or language in Brandom's case. Um, and this, this, make, this though is not an argument against my point, this actually shows my point, which is to say, again, if what pragmatism does is um, whenever it enters into a debate or where, wherever it enters into a philosophical domain is to treat that domain as processual or transitional. And we see that with Dewey writing on experience, um, then it's really that processual transitional um, angle of pragmatism that, that constitutes its true center. And um, unlike experience in language, it wouldn't even occur to anybody philosophically to treat action as static. And whereas Dewey, by contrast, was constantly bumping up against the challenge of weaning his processual dynamic experience pragmatism away from the static flat treatment of experience, a sixth sense experience that you find in classical empiricism. Um, and that's something that, you know, Rorty argued Dewey never ultimately succeeded at. Um, one way Rorty makes that argument is to say, oh, well, Dewey himself admitted that he didn't succeed at it because he eventually abandoned the term experience and wanted to replace it with the term culture because that sort of gets more at the kind of dynamic treatment that he's looking to give. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the lesson of that is not so much that, that Dewey's wrong, but it's rather that we can have a more clear-sighted pragmatism if we just hone in on those essentially transitional domains that are already internal to pragmatism anyway. Um, so a conduct pragmatism isn't going to get sort of lost in the thickets of um, more classical philosophical options that treat things as fixed or as eternal. Again, we can do that with experience and language. There are plenty of philosophies out there that treat experience or language as fixed, um, but there's no possible reasonable, at least philosophical option for treating action as fixed. Um, so that said, issue a challenge like that. And of course, some philosopher is gonna come along and give an account of action as fixed and non-transitional, but um, I guess we deal with that when we get there. Um, so um, one, one way in which I make this argument in, in the paper that this is drawn from is actually to turn to um, the, um, the in parts pragmatist analytic philosopher, uh, um, Georg Henrik von Richt, um, who was a contemporary, who was writing in, in the mid 20th century um, in the um, in in the UK, um, and um, von Richt writes that um, making kind of the point that I make here, um, acts are essentially connected with changes. A necessary requirement of a logic of action is therefore a logic of change. So what's important for me there is von Richt's recognition that acts are essentially connected with changes. Um, and that comes from his, again, 1963 work, um, Norm and Action. And part of what's important for me about von Rick's contribution there is situating action vis-a-vis -vis questions of normativity that I think um, rightly deserve philosophical pride of place because those are the toughest things for us philosophically to explain. We really need philosophy when it comes to normativity, I think. Um, and von Richt is there sort of, he's sketching out the connection between action and, and normativity. Um, so again, this leaves us with the essentially transitional nature of action. Um, and this gives us what I call an actionistic analytics that would, and this is sort of where I started with, would be a, a kind of methodological lens for looking at epistemological, moral, or political issues in terms of the dynamic flows of conduct that condition them. Um, so let me give a sense now of what that looks like, um, specifically with an emphasis on this bolded term here, political. Um, that's my focus because primarily my work is in political philosophy. So I sort of know the lay of the land um, 
a little bit more cleanly. Uh, but again, I think of pragmatism as, you know, what's behind this is a conception of pragmatism as primarily methodological, such that the methodology would be portable to any important philosophical domain that if pragmatism as an actionistic analytics can help us make sense of political and social issues, then it ought to also be able to help us make sense of questions in epistemology, questions in aesthetics, um, et cetera. So, but let me just briefly focus on the political dimensions here. Um, and there's kind of two things that I do in the, the manuscript paper that this is drawn from. Um, I mentioned this on the handout. I'm sort of at Roman numeral three at this point. Um, and I ask on the handout, what does a focus on the varying rhythms of quick or slow practical transitions look like in political philosophy? And we can address this question in at least two ways. And one way is to elaborate it vis-a-vis -vis contemporary work in uh, pragmatist political inquiry. And here I specifically have in mind um, less work in political philosophy and more work in political science coming from political scientists who are motivated by pragmatism. Um, and then second, um, I think we can also excavate this um, in terms of um, more project that would um, look like some of what I've been doing here already, which would be more kind of a look into the history of philosophy and looking back into pragmatism's past for clues. Um, so let me just, very briefly, um, I'm not going to have time to go into the first of those in any detail, um, but um, let me briefly just sort of show where that ends up. And from there, we can come back to this if people want. Um, so I'm skipping a number of slides here. Um, and what I end up with is this is, I realize, a very overwhelming slide. Um, so, um, but what we kind of have here are, um, you know, this is a two by two grid in terms of what does political theory look to explain um, and what does political theory use to make its explanations all couched in terms of the kind of pragmatist orienting exception of everything is motion, everything is action. Um, and um, so what we have then in terms of the explananda are stable political orders versus political changes. Um, so uh, stable political orders on the left column, political changes or political revolutions on the right column, uh, political transformation on the right column. Um, are those explained by on the bottom row structures, relatively slow moving things, um, say in the US context, something like um, a constitution or in the context of Western democracy, something like the nation state as a deep structure that's very slow moving, but it's important to this perspective that you wouldn't treat something like the nation state or something like the social contract as unmoving or unmovable, right? We're not looking for something fixed. We're not looking for that Archimedean point. We're looking for that which is slow to change. So it's always a differentiation between the relatively slow and the relatively fast. Um, so that bottom row refers to deep political structures that are relatively slow to change. The top row refers to political dynamics, that which sort of relatively quickly changes. So then what I kind of have sort of sketched out um, and um, here in, in this grid is different um, kinds of explanations that the political inquirer might offer. Um, and there, so two of these options, though, I want to argue don't sit well with pragmatism. And that's the one option is one that would explain um, political transformation on the basis of other political, um, uh, that would explain political revolution or, or relatively fast political change on the basis of relatively fast political movement. That's this pure becomings option. This would be inattentive to the inertia of stability in politics. In other words, there would be, to put it in Hegelian terms, no recognition of determinacy. Um, but another option that I think doesn't sit well with pragmatism is a dialectical option, which disavows the possibility of real change and takes all difference, all political difference, all political change is already rationally determined. Um, and that's, that's a kind of Hegelian option, um, at least I would argue. Um, so I think pragmatism needs to move back and forth between these two views that I call stabilizing dynamics and transforming orders, where basically we're explaining um, political um, transformations on the basis of um, um, slow changing stabilizations on the one hand, 
or on the other hand, we're explaining the ability of these slow moving deep political institutions to be changeable ultimately um, on the basis of their ongoing transformations. Um, so um, I realize that's, that's kind of a lot, that's a very quick, um, much, much too quick overview of that slide. We can come back to that. Let me just, um, you know, for those who are interested, zoom in to, there are a couple of political scientists whose work I'm borrowing from here. Um, Nicholas Jabko and Adam Scheingate at Johns Hopkins have this great paper, Practices of Dynamic Order from 2018. I'm building on that, as well as work by actually my colleagues here at University of Oregon, uh, Gerald Burke and Dennis Galvan. Their excellent paper, How People Experience and Change Institutions, a Field Guide to Creative Syncretism. And especially if you know, if you if you work in political philosophy and you're looking for, well, what would political philosophy look like? What would pragmatist political philosophy look like in a more kind of applied sense, a more applied approach to politics? I, I would highly recommend both of these papers as giving. A, uh, I mean, these are basically Deweyan uh, political thinkers in political science departments um, trying to make sense of how we understand institutions and how we understand how how institutions change in a Deweyan lens, thinking that through Dewey. Um, so I think that's something that a lot of political philosophers who are, are persuaded by pragmatism would be interested in. Um, again, that said, I realize there's a lot there, so I'm, I'm just going to move forward. We can come back to this if people are interested. Um, and let me just turn now to this next set of questions about um, tracing this not through contemporary political theory and the discipline of political science, but through the history of um, political philosophy. And um, I'll, I'll take just kind of five more minutes here and then I'll, I'll be finished. So let me just, let's just look at this history for five more minutes. Um, and then we can open things up to some conversation. Um, so again, I, I take my bearings from James here, not only with respect to the kind of actionistic analytics that I see is at the heart of pragmatism, um, but also in terms of the way in which I think I see pragmatism's best options today as a political philosophy. Um, and I think what's valuable in James's approach is what I'll call a double barreled pragmatism um, that um, encompasses, or um, a better term here would be to say that it motivates or creates pathways both for the kinds of political inquiry we see in Dewey's work in books like Public and Its Problems, um, and as well makes room for and motivates a kind of um, an, an alternative within the wider orbit of pragmatist political thought um, to something like W.E.B. Du Bois's contestatory pragmatism. Um, there's a lot to say here, by the way, about my um, um, including Du Bois in this lineage specifically as a pragmatist, um, that's something I would stand by, but I would stand by it only if it did not involve the reduction of the real breadth of Du Bois's work to just pragmatism. I think pragmatism is one of many dimensions in Du Bois. Again, there's a lot more to say about that and we can um, get, get into that as people like. Um, so let me just sort of situate this, though, with respect to something that um, you all may be familiar with, um, which is um, what I'll just kind of quickly call pragmatism's three value logic. Um, and I kind of think about this through the lens of Dewey writing on purse um, at the outset of his 1938 book, Logic. Um, and um, as I have it here on the slide, most political theory operates with an epistemology relying on a two value logic. There's the true and there's the false. And sort of everything kind of gets divided divided up between the true and the false. Um, and you know, there's obviously a much broader epistemology at work there that's uh, at play not just in political philosophy, but I'm restricting myself to the political here. Um, so for an example of this dialectical political theory, um, well, conceptualize transformations only as a function of contradictions or determinant negations, the becoming false of what was true. Um, but pragmatism offers a different approach. It offers this approach where there's a third term. There's the true, the false, and the doubtful. Um, to put that a little differently, political situations um, can be either determinate, that means they can be either determinately true or determinately false, or they can be indeterminate, i.e. a political situation can be problematic in Dewey's parlance um, or a problematization in Foucault's parlance. Um, and I think it's this recognition or this countenancing of this third option of the, of the problematic or the doubtful I mean, this runs through pragmatism and so much, so many of its different um, iterations. 
Um, but this is particularly important um, in the context of pragmatist political theory because it allows us to get out of the dialectical game of thinking that we need to analyze political reality um, in terms of um, situations or events that are always determinant. Rather, it enables us to recognize the indeterminacy that often characterizes the political. Um, so one way to think about this um, is in terms of James's work in um, something like the moral philosopher in the moral life, um, where James recognizes both um, in, in social and political reality, a movement both from the indeterminate to the determinate and from the determinate to the indeterminate. Um, James writes of, um, in that essay of more inclusive orders being formed of that which was previously distributed and strewn about, that which was previously in conflict, achieving a unity, achieving a kind of inclusiveness or an inclusion. And this is making determinate what was previously a conflicted and determinate situation. He also writes in that very same essay about the necessity of butchering the ideal. And this is James's deep value pluralism, which would later resonate with somebody like Isaiah Berlin, but uh, butchering the ideal, this, you know, this is the determinant being made indeterminate. This is that which is determinant being rended and sort of torn apart. Um, some part of the ideal must be butchered, is, is James's phrase. Um, so what we find in James, um, I would argue, is um, a pragmatism in multiple, what I call it, a double barrel pragmatism. Um, shooting through one barrel, James portrays pragmatist uh, political theory or pragmatist ethics in these terms. He writes, ethical science is just like physical science. Um, this ought to sound a little bit like Dewey, but shooting just as quickly out of the other barrel, it is a pragmatism that accepts victory and defeat there must be, and that asks us to, quote, see everywhere the struggle and the squeeze, end quote. So neither of these movements or motions in James is the complete and final word. Both are ingredient in the flux that is political reality. Both are irreducible aspects of the dynamics of political conduct in James. So what I want to kind of argue and giving again James pride of place is that James sort of opens up both of these paths and makes a makes, I think, offers a compelling way to seeing both of these as essential to pragmatism. Um, and then coming forward out of James, we see half of this, um, again, just kind of zooming out so you kind of see the, visually how I'm setting this up. We see half of this in Dewey's reconstructive progressivist political theory, um, but we don't see all of it there. Um, we see this movement in Dewey from um, the indeterminate to the determinate. We see in Dewey's public and its problems a, a movement whereby um, the unintended effects of actions in mass industrial societies um, are organized and the community is reunified and there's a more inclusive ideal and a more a fuller democratic uh, project at work. Um, and that's, um, that's valuable, that's essential. We, we need that in pragmatism. Um, we need this work of reconstructing. We need this work of determining that which is problematically indeterminate. Um, but it's also not the whole story um, because some, we also need to make room in our analysis of the political for not just a descriptive fact of or a recognition that, um, but also a, um, a, a willingness to understand the value of something like contestation that we see in somebody like W.E.B. Du Bois in his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, where he's making an argument for the need or the value of going the other way, of taking a situation that's taken to be determinate and rendering it indeterminate. In other words, of opening up the political scene to contestation and change, um, to open up the political scene to agitation, and to affliction. Um, and being able to recognize that, and again, recognize that in its value. So not just the description of it or uh, countenancing of it, but countenancing it in its value, in its, in its importance for political life. Whereas you tend to get in Dewey, I think only the sense that these problems are only ever sort of in the way, they're only ever stuff to be dealt with and cleaned up. I think in Du Bois, you have a more positive recognition of problematization as that which can motivate political change, that which can motivate transformations in political reality. Um, and so let me just end here then by nodding to Foucault um, about whom um, I would love to talk further because I see Foucault here as resonating with pragmatism in a number of ways, but specifically resonating with pragmatist political theory along this more Du Boisian line of a kind of contestatory analytics or a problematizational analytics. Um, 
where there's again this movement from the determinant to the indeterminate. You can think about this in terms of genealogical problematization, the way in which it unsettles and it questions. Um, genealogy takes that which was taken to be natural and shows it to have been historical or contingent. That doesn't mean that it holds us, you know, if you think of book, Foucault's book on sexuality, showing that the history of, showing that sex itself is historical doesn't give the dispositif of sexuality any less of a grip on us, but it does show us that it itself is the result of a um, remarkable series of historical transformations that are therefore ongoingly transforming. Um, so there's, there's opportunity and room for change and transformation there, as difficult as it may be. Um, it unsettles in questions. Parenthetical point, we can talk about this later. Um, I would reject any view that would turn Foucault into Hegelian um, by saying that what Foucault is doing with problematization is negating um, or offering a kind of determinate rejection of that, which are the objects of his study. Foucault is not rejecting the modern dispositif of sexuality. If what he says in history of sexuality is true, that's not even, I mean, that's not even an option. It's not even something that any of us could conceive. Like, what would it mean to reject sexuality? Um, that's, that's not what Foucault is doing. Rather, he's excavating it as a problematizational site within which we elaborate ourselves, within which our social configurations get debated or the terrain upon which our social configurations get set up or stood up. Um, so there's a lot more to say there. Um, some of you here know that I've tried to write an entire book on that, successful or not, I don't know. I, we, I'm you know, mentioning Foucault here. Um, it's certainly a Foucault that I read through Deleuze. Um, especially with respect to um, Deleuze's book on Nietzsche, which situates what's typically called post-structuralism within a lineage that is not anti-Hegelian, but moves outside of the shadow of Hegel, um, and finally offers a new way forward in political theory without being beholden to Hegelianism. In a very different way, um, I know this is a bit of a provocation, perhaps for my friend Saren here, I would situate uh, some of Wittgenstein's work along the same kind of lineage. Um, but there's a much uh, longer uh, discussion to be had there. Um, and let me just end with this, because I'm kind of making this implicit claim here that Foucault's work is, has something important to contribute to pragmatism and that you know, uh, by the same token, pragmatism has something important to contribute to Foucault's work. Um, but doesn't that sound strange? Does, does, do, do genealogy and pragmatism really sit well with one another? Um, you know, if you thumb through the recent literature, these are two figures who are not, uh, these are two traditions that are not often associated with one another. Um, of course, we have here in the room with us, John Sturr, who, um, um, while I was still um, an undergraduate, was um, detecting and, and developing connections between Foucault and the pragmatists in ways that I think are really rich. Um, so it's not an unheard of option, but let me just kind of say how I, I would understand it, how I would make sense of it. Um, and I think John would agree with me that, that probably we're still in the minority in terms of wanting to bring these two together. Um, or I think we would both put it this way. It's not wanting to bring the two together. They're already together. It's really about recognizing the, the value in um, running Foucault and pragmatism alongside one another. Um, so my claim is not that Foucault is a pragmatist in the Deweyan sense of a commitment to the reconstruction of problematic situations. Obviously, discipline and punish is not something like uh, you know, an a, a applied public and its problems. Um, rather, my claim is that genealogy is resonant methodologically with pragmatism in the following two ways. There's this theorization of indeterminacy. Again, this third category, not just the determinately true, the determinately false, but also that which is a problematization in Foucault, that which is a problematic situation. And do we were going to recognize that as part of the political? And again, this methodological attention to conduct, action, and practice as the focus of analysis. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll end with where I started, which is that the best option in pragmatism is the conduct option. We see that in the early James. Um, and we see the same in Foucault, who's not, um, I think Foucault is more um, commonly, more frequently, discussed as um, a theorist of practice, but it's still not something that's, that's prominent enough in the literature. Um, but if you go looking for it, um, when you find these moments in Foucault where he says things like the exercise of power consists in the conduct of conducts, right? You find things where Foucault says power exists only in action. I mean, Foucault's thought of as the philosopher of power, 
But what he's saying here is that, well, if I'm the philosopher of power, I'm also the philosopher of action or conduct because I analyze power through the lens of action or I analyze power as consisting in the conduct of conduct. Both, um, in other words, both practice and problematization um, appear together in Foucault. And those are sort of two ways then in which Foucault's methodologically resonant with pragmatism. So let me end there. I know that's a lot um, to, to put out. Um, but I welcome um, discussion and conversation. Um, happy to answer questions, but also happy to just um, discuss this with all of you. So thank you so much. Wonderful, Colin. Thank you so much. I think that uh, there will be so many issues to discuss. The first discussant is here with us is uh, Sarin Marchetti a dear friend from the University of Roma La Sapienza, where he teaches uh, bioethics and moral philosophy, is author of the volume Ethics and Philosophical Critique in William James, a very important book on James, and uh, co-edited uh, uh, a volume on the encounter between analytical and continental philosophy, the title is Pragmatism and the European Tradition in our <laughs> uh, interest. He's also the general editor of the European Journal of Pragmatism and uh, American Philosophy. So please, Sarin. So uh, once again, uh, many thanks to both Rossella and uh, Maria Regina for the invitation, for the guy invitation, and and for and 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 thanks to Colin for the wonderful talk. So how do you how the hell you respond to this talk? So I'll try to do my best, and uh, I'll try to speak for ten minutes. So I'll just try to, uh, and I was as as I was uh, uh, the the talk was going on. I take even more notes than I <laughs> on, on the top of the previous one. So I'll try to stick to. Uh, a few and uh, more exactly to two points. So I'll, I'll try to, to raise one methodological point and one more ethical political point. So, um, but first, uh, and, and, and I mean this, uh, Colin was one and still is one of my, my favorite uh, pragmatist people. So uh, it's gonna be very hard for me to criticize his views and it's gonna be very, very hard since we share so much but I'll try to push him to the limits and I'll try to push this conduct uh, option uh, to the limits. And uh, so the first point is a methodological point and it has to do, and we heard plenty about this in the, in the middle section of the paper, that is how do you describe, how do you understand practice as a methodological tool? What do you mean and one, what uh, 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 one does mean by methodological tool? So we heard that the premise of practice has to do, can you hear me fine? Okay, uh, the premise of practice has to do with the rejection and that's, that was the, that's the frame of the, the talk and the, the overall frame of, of Colin's work in these topics uh, as the rejection of the experience first and the language first uh, options. And this is to say, as we heard tonight as well, um, or this morning in Colin's time, uh, that is that both uh, what we experience and what we uh, 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 talk about, they are both uh, ways of conducting oneself. So in order to understand what we are talking about and what we are getting out of experience, we need truly need to check what we are doing with ourselves and with the world. So that's the that's kind of angle. And this is quite important as, as um, Colin was saying, because this goes against uh, two, uh, and, 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 and that's part of a strategy to get rid of two forms of authoritarianism. Uh, one is givenism, that is the idea according to which experience is all we need to attend in order to get meaning, uh, 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 value and whatnot. And the other one being lingualism, that is the idea according to which uh, we need to attend language in order to get, uh, uh, ex uh, to get meaning, to get value, to get significance. And why is that? Why is it that experience, practice, conduct uh, is not uh, or would not 
count as a form of auto, uh, 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 authoritarianism in itself is because as Colin was claiming, uh, conduct is flexible, is a flux, is something you do uh, build uh, and something which is built and uh, there is no uh, origin in a sense. And that, that is also a question for Colin. So it seems that conduct is less prone to authoritarianism than language, either language or um, experience. And I take this, so this is all part of the uh, first methodological point. And Colin is adding that um, taking care to take care and uh, actively reworking one conduct, one can address the problematic situation we are in, that is, when we are stuck, both in our experience, we don't know what to attend to, and we don't know what to say, then we need to take a look at what we do, at what are the consequences of both experience of the feeling and of the uh, talking. Um, so, and that's the story of pragmatism, that's the story of, of the founding fathers, as much as the story of the later installments of pragmatism, uh, um, that is the story of certainty as against doubt, certainty as against uncertainty. So the point is that we, when we are stuck, it is because mostly we are looking for certainty where we find known or we don't find it anymore. So our habits are stuck. So how we, do we go from there? So how do we go on without relying on either experience or language? Um, so conduct is something which in itself seems to be the, the way we, 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 oh, we might uh, uh, um, picture it is a concept, a, methodolo a methodology, which is built uh, in contraposition with fixity and hence the idea of pragmatism inviting us to be mobile uh, as a remedy from breaking up. So the more plastic and mobile we are, the lesser prone to breaking up from breaking up we are. Hence, my worry uh, about the conduct option, which by the way, if of any interest is also my own option. So, but I still think that there is something going on methodologically here. That is, if you, if you uh, look at what James says, for example, he says, pragmatism is only, it is a methodology only, it's a method only, it comes with no, uh, uh, fixed results in itself. Um, so the question is, how open-ended is conduct, truly? Um, is being against metaphysics, by metaphysics we mean anything which is fixed, which is out there, which is done and dealt with without any uh, uh, involvement from our part? Uh, how is it that one can be uh, against metaphysics and yet not committed to anything else in particular. So that's a very, at broad strokes, that's, that's the problem we, we all conduct pragmatists uh, have. And at which coast, which is the coast of this? And this leans to work uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, relates to the second question. So there are no particular answer, uh, and yet we are prizing activity. So conduct doesn't give you solutions, but still to be, mobile is better than to be not to be mobile. So which kind of statement is that from a methodological point of view? Uh, so this would be my first suggestion for Colin. And uh, in order to show this, I, could, I, I, I wrote down just a, a two uh, installments of this, um, uh, 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 a possible answer to this. So what is conduct from a methodological point of view? Uh, there have been, uh, uh, many uh, answers, but mostly within pragmatism, we might want to uh, divide the, the answer into two uh, uh, um, options. Uh, one which I call a substantive option, that is that in order to understand why is it that conduct is a method which is free of any uh, singular answer and yet it praises activity over passivity, you do that by analyzing conduct. So what conduct is. And that's the kind of angle Peirce uh, 
uh, uh, um, subscribe to, brand them, subscribe to maybe. Um, and that's a more substantive. So to write a positive story about what conduct is, and that would be in terms of habits and reinforcement of habit and breaking up habits and, and the likes. On the other end, <clears throat> so, and notice that this would cut across the previous uh, distinction in between language and experience. Uh, so the other option would be what I would call after Rory, uh, a quiet is option, according to which we have no positive story to tell about conduct. And that's very important for the second point that I'm gonna make. So that's the first suggestion uh, question uh, for Colin. And the second one would be, and I'm sorry, I'm, all, all, um, I'm uh, already talking too much, but uh, that is connected, this methodological uh, question and puzzle that I have, and that we have, is connected in my opinion to a, an ethical political one. Which also, which also resonates with a, a later part of the talk, a very, very, very interesting talk. Uh, that is, and this is a worry actually from a biographical point of view. I only come up with very recently, I, I would say in the last year or so. Um, that is that, okay, so the immediate outcomes of this are clear, political outcomes and ethical outcomes. That is the good of, the good of activity has to do with the capacity to live with doubt rather than to get rid of it. So uh, the good of activity has to do, and the, and the priority of practice has to do from an ethical political point of view with the celebration of unsettlement and perspectivism. And that's, that's quite the easy answer. And that, I, I guess that's also a true answer, a, a sound answer at least. But I think there is more to it, and hence my second question and, and um, idea for Colin. That is then on one hand, we hear plenty and we heard plenty about conduct um, in terms of um, getting rid of a world in which there are experiential and linguistic authorities. And that's very important. And if you take someone like Rory, uh, he has this whole story uh, that basically is told uh, throughout his books about how the uh, came into maturity has to do with the getting rid of um, external uh, hierarchies. Uh, so, and languages could even be an external hierarchy and the world could be an external hierarchy for sure religion uh, has been science could be. Uh, and so that, that's a story. So the giving up and the giving away and the doing away with external hierarchies. But then the more I've been reading Rory and, and, and other authors within pragmatism, the more I realized that if you're really committed to this uh, conduct option, then you might not want to, of course, uh, uh, you might still want to, and that's the point of external hierarchies, you might uh, and you should uh, uh, get rid of what it's known in philosophy as correspondentism and representationalism. So the idea according to which to get values, truth, and meaning you have to mirror something which is external to your own practices, to your, to your conduct. But then I find myself, I found myself suddenly more and more, either sud both suddenly and more and more as I was reading into this stuff, a uh, puzzle by what you might lose uh, by doing this. And what you might be losing, even according, even by Rudy's lights, is reality. The reality of exactly the reality, not the reality of and conduct as a feature of reality, something you might find in, and here, of course, there are experts on this, on, in, uh, uh, in someone like Bergson or Whitehead. So, Conduct is how reality is made uh, and what reality is made of. Um, but rather, if you push too much on practice as a product, product of subjectivity, so if you keep uh, alive the romantic, as in romanticism, project of getting rid of external hierarchies and yet 
and replace them with internal ones, then I think you might lose something very important, which is reality. Not reality in the sense of what is out there, but reality in the sense of what uh, causes a friction in your own practices and the realities and the reality of the practices themselves. And I and I close and with this, uh, Rory and. Uh, of course, you, and you probably know most of this uh, 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 work uh, and writings. Uh, Rudy has a, 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 he borrows a, a word uh, uh, from literature and in a rather, uh, it's not a minor, but it's, it's for some reason is a rather uh, unknown piece called uh, Redemption from Egotism. He used the word egotism as the idea according to which, as, as the vice according to which once you give up the world, then you have all the answers. Because if it's really up to us, then we are in a way, if not self-transparent to ourselves, but still if conduct is something we uh, um, uh, build up, then nothing really could go wrong or nothing could go wrong, which can't be fixed. So, and my worry is that probably we would get, we would need uh, to use Colin's terms, an analytics of conduct also in the sense in which conduct is much more real than just the wishing and the willing of uh, selves engage in projects of transformation, self-transformation. So that's my offering to Colin and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Colin, uh, you may re reply now. And uh, if there are other questions, I think that people can write on the chat um, their disposition to, to talk. Please. Maybe we can take other, thank you, Saren, so much. Um, this, this is, um, yeah, these are so, your questions are so stimulating and so needed for the project. Maybe we can take other questions and I can kind of try to weave them in. Um, I mean, I have a bunch of notes scribbled down here from just the last few minutes. So I have much to say, but I see that there are a few questions too. Um... Allora, vedo una domanda, ma magari è meglio se, se sei tu, Silvia. Um... Yes, I can moderate. I think Maria Regina uh, has a question. But First. also there is one before, Yvonne. Yvonne and, and Stuart, Professor Stuart. Stuart? I add myself. Okay. So maybe it's okay if uh, starts Maria Regina from the organizer. Okay. Uh, Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the lecture. Um, I had two questions, but one is uh, probably the same of uh, the first point. Sorry, uh, uh, that uh, Sarin made. Sorry. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, I just uh, uh, let uh, Yvonne uh, talk and then uh, <laughs> uh, have my question for later. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my kid is in front of the TV, so I also don't know how long he's gonna hold up. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I have a question um, on the rhetoric, on the logic of the rhetorics of the talk. Uh, meaning, um, how much of your argument depends on the outset of playing these threefold uh, of, of playing this uh, three approaches off against one another? No, I mean experience linguistics and conduct um is it i mean that's what has been done no that um people say yeah uh, the classics are the ones with experience and then there's linguistics uh center it now you uh make your point for conduct so i mean do you need it um is it part of your um approach that you want to make the step or is it that you want to introduce political philosophy of conduct, actually, and that's the focus. Because then maybe, yeah, I would, 
I mean, because I'm questioning this um, threefoldness, no? Because you can do that internally, logically. You can say, yeah, okay, but um, this um, playing off the classics against the new pragmatists uh, as experience against the language has always been outrageous. So why insist on that, no? And then maybe we as academics actually should engage when we have red royalty in uh, conception engineering and don't use that distinction anymore now. And then so why insist on it by putting yet another one on top of it, no, a conduct uh, pragmatism. So that's the rhetorical point, no, and um, logically, yeah, maybe conduct then actually, if you want to have it in, maybe it would be better to have it as an overarching uh, approach, no, because you certainly could um, frame experience via conduct and I mean, Austin, I mean, or also Brandon, I mean, it's, it's not just semantics, it's also pragmatics, no. Um, so maybe, maybe you could, so, that's a suggestion that maybe you could um, not split it off in three, but say the other two are better framed uh, when you crouch it in conduct terms as an as an overarching concept. No, but um, yeah. So the question is, how much depends on on this uh, threefoldness, or is it actually that you want to do um, political theory of conduct, and the other thing is just the yeah frame for it that you could also toss. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, that's thanks, thanks, Yvonne. Those are great questions. I think um, so. Do I need to frame? In a way, no. Um, you're right. I don't. Um, that said, I think there's kind of two projects simultaneously that I'm pursuing. Your your question kind of helps me sort of distinguish them. One is a more meta philosophical or meta theoretical project, and that's mostly what I talked about today in terms of. I think that does require the framing. In other words, if I'm making an a metaphilosophical intervention into political philosophy methodologies, then I need to situate the conduct option vis-a-vis -vis the other options that are um, available within the tradition of pragmatism. I would also argue, though I did not do so today, that this is not just the history of pragmatism in the 20th century. This is the history of uh, uh, Western philosophy in the 20th century. I mean, you see this running across phenomenology as it moves from somebody like Husserl to somebody like Derrida, you get sort of highly experiential, you end with a highly textual, you see this in critical theory from, um, you know, moving to Habermas from sort of earlier approaches of Horkheimer, etc. Um, so, you know, I think it's not just a story about pragmatism that I'm telling. Um, but so that framing is needed, yeah, really only for the metaphilosophical work. And I would say that you're right, though, that there's plenty of room to like as it were, like just go do conduct pragmatist political philosophy and not worry about the methodological trappings, but just kind of um, deploy or implement or mobilize is the term I like the the methodology, and that's what I tried to do a little bit in my most recent book on data politics, um, where there's nothing at all about experience language and conduct. It's all just sort of um, looking into the histories of um, data politics with an eye to um, the way that information has constructed the subject and delimited forms of action for the subject. Um, so basically, yes, um, to that. So the other question um, about, I mean, the logical point, seeing conduct as kind of overarching banner. Um, yeah, I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, I think, I think, I think the basic choice that that's sort of on the table is is conduct the overarching banner and experience and language are instances of conduct? Or is it the case that we have, again, and I probably more on this latter line, that we have a true triad and there are aspects of experience that are not held within a conduct perspective and aspects of language that are not held within a conduct perspective, but that conduct is kind of, um, um, again, at least for the purposes of political philosophy, and you know, I'd want to say el elsewhere as well, conduct um, offers, conduct is that which takes priority. So I, you know, I want to leave room for something like in political theory, something like a recognition of the role of the aesthetic in political transformation. Um, but I want to sort of sideline, you know, I want to recognize that. I don't want to pretend that that's not there. I don't want to pretend that that's just sort of a feature of practice. Um, but I also want to sideline that, especially insofar as it's been given prominence in more recent political theory, 
Um, in part because, um, and you know, this is something I nodded to a few times in the talk, but didn't get into. You know, I think ultimately what we're answerable to are questions of normativity. Um, I mean, I think that's what we need philosophy for. If we didn't have the normative questions on the table, then we really, we could still do philosophy, but there wouldn't be sort of as much to it. Um, so insofar as that's kind of ultimately sort of what we're after, um, right, yeah, what we're after then, um, then I think centering conduct more, that's, that's really the right way to see it. It's, it's that it's centering, that it takes priority, um, that it's, yeah, that it's sort of, that it comes first, um, but not that it's the only thing and everything else, because then I worry that I would have to get into a kind of, I'd have to make a metaphysical move and get into a metaphysical debate about, um, you know, with somebody who's going to come up with, with compelling counterexamples that, well, here's an instance of language, or here's an instance of experience that aren't, that don't clearly look like conduct. So why are you claiming everything is conduct? Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, Saren mentioned this kind of a little bit in his comments, but, you know, I don't want to get into those kinds of metaphysical debates. Um, and, but it's not because, and so here I'll respond to something Saren said, it's not because I'm anti-metaphysics. Um, though Saren's not entirely wrong to say that. I mean, um, in a way I am, um, but that's more to kind of borrow from Rory here. That's more in my private life. Publicly, I am not anti-metaphysics. Um, you know, I don't know what that would mean. Rather, I'm just, you know, but at the same time, I want to carve out space for philosophical methodologies that aren't beholden to metaphysics. So I want, I want there to be room for um, doing philosophy that does not take itself to be answerable to metaphysical questions. I take it, by the way, that that was Rorty's own position. I don't think Rorty wanted to stop people from asking metaphysical questions or stop them from asking religious questions. I just think he wanted to say that sometimes we can get good philosophical work done without taking those questions on board. So that's, that's really, you know, I just want to kind of carve out that space for myself, um, in part because um, I find that when I do try to do it, I'm often um, accosted with metaphysical questions that, well, you have to answer this metaphysical question, that metaphysical question. Um, and I, you know, I kind of take a Rorian approach to that, it's, you know, well, what's the force of the have to, like, what do I have to answer that metaphysical question there? Um, I mean, if I, if I or somebody in my position finds that metaphysical question valuable, then we should take it on board. Um, but there's no, there's no mustness to it. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's, that it's not then that conduct for me is anti-metaphysical, it's rather that it's outside of the shadow of metaphysics or it's a-metaphysical or non-metaphysical. Um, but I certainly don't wanna put myself in the position of having to argue that other people can't do metaphysics and not only for political reasons, I mean, that would be politically just a disastrous move, um, but for philosophical reasons. You know, I don't think one can make an argument against the, it's, it's not as if one can say metaphysics is an incoherent project. I mean, that itself would be a metaphysical argument. Though. So to me, that's, that, that doesn't go very far. Um, so that's, you know, maybe kind of that description a little bit explains why I wouldn't want to see conduct as the overarching option, um, because then I would find myself drawn into a metaphysical debate that I, you know, I'm not convinced that having that metaphysical debate would be important or valuable for this project. That said, I'm not, against the possibility that it would be. I just kind of haven't been shown that yet. Um, and the last little point I'll tag on there is, you know, I think one can find, yeah, and going back to Dewey, there's definitely emphasis on, in that case, it's clear. There's a, you know, Dewey wanted to pull experience towards practice, but just didn't quite get there. And Brandon, I'm a little less, you know, Brandon says that he's doing an analysis of semantics in terms of pragmatics. Um, but Brandom is only interested in pragmatics because it explains something about semantics. In other words, Brandom has no independent interest in pragmatics at all, from what I can tell. Um, so he's not serious about pragmatics. He only wants to pull it in as, as an explanant, um, but it's not independently what's of value. Um, so I really don't see um, much in the way of action in Brandom, though. Um, but I'd be, yeah, I'd be curious if, if somebody sort of finds moments in random that would be closer to the view that I have, that would actually be a plus for me, but I don't see it, at least not right now. So Maria Regina, if you want to. And I can try to <laughs> formulate my question. So basically, um, I, um, I want to ask you um, about a clarification of, um, 
about the, the very concept of conduct or in general, your activist uh, pragmatism, because um, I take advantage of the quote uh, you made by Peirce, uh, I mean that one in the Baldwin Dictionary, because mm -hmm. as far as I have understood that passage and other related also in that period, uh, um, the difference, and Peirce says that also many times in the correspondence with James, the difference when he says, uh, I do not uh, suggest uh, that option anymore, uh, or not that stronger is that uh, for him um, there is a, um, a big difference between action uh, and habit. So uh, basically uh, referring to James, uh, he says many times that uh, James reduce uh, action to reaction, while uh, his point is that, is that action is more broader. I mean, action especially implies uh, a purpose. So how do you uh, think this connection with purpose? And to that, to that extent, uh, I mean, uh, with reference to purpose, I think that there is a kind of, we can say maybe ideal part. So um, not to reduce action to reaction, we, we need to take into account also purpose. And so uh, what, um, I mean, um, when we say, for instance, that an action is set satisfactory, we uh, can say that it's satisfactory uh, um, regard to some uh, purpose or goals or so I just want to to ask you if you can clarify a little bit more this point yeah thank you that's that's um I'm I'm very sympathetic to that view um which is to say um or yeah I'm sympathetic to what I understand the the Persian view that you're describing to be, which is to say, I think um, one can mine out of Purse a conception of action where um, there's a purposiveness to it, um, which, you know, there'd be an interesting side question to what extent is purpose there uh, sufficiently close to intention, um, to what extent is purpose there sufficiently close to something like intentional action under a description. Um, so yeah, so there's, um, there's a conception of action in purse where purpose is central to the action um, in a way that, that I think um, you're right, that purse was right to, um, push against the position that he saw in James there. Um, I'm not sure James had the position he was pushing against, but if James had it, it deserves to be pushed against. Um, so here's, here's how I think about this, though it's, it's not entirely in Percy in terms, but, um, but nevertheless, but I think the, the, the claim is right um, that, um, that there's, there are places in purse where this gets worked out. Um, and so I, I think about it in terms of we need um, to be able to make a distinction. Of course, we need to distinguish between actions and events um, if we're gonna get anywhere with pragmatism. Um, and we also need to make a distinction between actions and what we could just call, though this word itself is so slippery, um, something like behavior. And I think this is probably why Rorty ultimately abandoned the term behaviorism because you need a word for something that organisms and creatures do that is not um, purposive or intentional um, in that sense in which you're, to, to which you're referring. Um, so let's just call that behavior. Um, so then the question for me becomes, okay, so if we need this distinction between action and behavior, how do we actually make that distinction? Can we, we if we make it in terms of purposiveness, then what's the mark of purposiveness? And then this is where, um, I'm not sure that Peirce had this fully worked out, but I'm also not, I'm not sure that, um, that I'm sure that he did it either. Um, because sometimes it sounds like the mark of purposiveness is something like thought, um, you know, and later, you know, I mentioned sort of action under description and some later analytic philosophy, the mark is gonna be something like a set of linguistic capacities. Um, and that's just sort of where I have, that's, that's where I'm left with the question. You know, I think it needs to be closer to um, 
something like what you know like um like a, a conception of discursiveness and here i would kind of i would be trying to pull this from brandon um that there's in an internal conceptual nature to action such that we can distinguish between action and behavior. However, if we do that, and then this would be my question back for all of you, to what extent do we have this in purse? If we do that, um, to what extent can we argue that conceptuality or discursiveness in the appropriate sense for that is not, um, is neither, um, entirely identified with language as it is for, for somebody like Brandon, but nor is it something that we, that we would allow to be a, a sort of mysterious mental entity in a way that I think Wittgenstein teaches us we shouldn't allow. I mean, if it's gonna be a mysterious mental entity, then I think we're at a dead end for like good Wittgensteinian reasons, just because we can't, then we're giving ourselves a free pass. If it's gonna be entirely linguistic, um, then I think we run up against the problems of linguistic pragmatism. So I think we need something like a conceptual pragmatism or pragmatist concept of, of conceptuality, such that conceptuality marks the difference between action and um, behavior slash event without reducing that marking to language or vocabulary. Um, and, so I hear in when you know when I read purses sort of pushing back against James, um, you know when he you know you know and he sort of talks you know says that well, James you're basically missing out on thirdness. I hear something of that in purse, um, but here's where the scholarship of of Rosella and, and many of you in the room exceeds my own. That you know I don't know, um, you know I haven't found in purse that's that sufficiently worked out, um, but that's not to say that it's not there. Um, so that's that's kind of, yeah, let me leave that as a kind of, um, you know, I see, a, I see a pathway there that I myself have not traveled down, but I'm, I'm open to, you know, I think there's a lot of intuition there in that if I'm turning to the early James here, I think purse, purse is so difficult for me because he was always moving. Right. And it's, it, he's always sort of working out, you know, I mean, he embodies pragmatism, like he is himself the process, right, that processual pragmatism calls for. And he's always moving and, um, you know, always working out ramifications and implications of the view. Um, and then the challenge for us, of course, is, you know, these are historical figures. So we need to pin them down and if, get them to stop, even though that's we shouldn't want to do that as pragmatists. Um, so, yeah, Maria Regina, I hope, I hope that sort of responds to what you're saying. And, you know, and it's not an answer, but I, I agree with the intuition of what you're saying. Uh, sorry, Sylvia, I'm not polite, but uh, may I add something uh, in this wave? Because uh, I think it's a right time <laughs> to, to say uh, sure. what I wish to say. Um, very briefly, uh, you quoted the, the famous pragmatistic maxim by Peirce, uh, where he talked, it's true, of practical bearings or practical effects, but he added a conceivable practical effects. So this uh, will be yeah. also later on the difference with James. Um, in purse, uh, action uh, is uh, always uh, um, um, coherent with uh, habit. So action is, uh, um, can be uh, considered as a form of habit, uh, habits of action, says purse. Uh, you quoted uh, an interesting uh, um, passage from James, a belief uh, is measured from action, he said. Uh, belief, uh, uh, belief in the uh, late purse uh, means uh, be ready to do something, be ready. And uh, in this sense, the readiness to act, uh, the disposition to act, uh, the attitude to act, um, refer to a wider space, I think, where um, actions, uh, where, uh, let's say in this way, um, 
we sometimes are ready to do, or all the times we are ready to do something, without knowing exactly what we are doing. So there is a space of indeterminacy. You talked also about that, of vagueness or conditionality that I don't think uh, uh, is equal to rationality. Hmm? The conditionality um, uh, lives uh, inside our actions. Our actions are not immediate effects, but have this uh, horizon of wide uh, indeterminacy that inhabits them. So um, I just, um, in, the, in the wave uh, of this uh, discussion, uh, love to, to, to know what are you thinking about this. I, yeah, thank you, Rosel. I think that's, that's all very well said. And that's, um, um, I've, I fully agree with all of that. Um, and I think, um, thank you especially for drawing our attention back to this uh, pragmatism's um, tolerance for, or even invitations to indeterminacy, because I think that would, you're right. I mean, that would be essential to kind of um, getting out of, some of the, the difficulties we find ourselves in here with respect to something like um, the purposiveness in virtue of which something is an action and the conceptual dimensions of that. And we would have to, if we don't wanna reduce those conceptual dimensions to just language, then I think part of the story there is recognizing um, the indeterminacy that's potential within any conceptuality. Um, and it's there maybe in a way that is stronger or more pronounced than something like the indeterminacy of language. Um, I mean, I think we can kind of take on board claims about the indeterminacy of language, but there's, there's you know, going to be um, definite limits to that. Whereas with conceptuality, um, with non-linguistic conceptuality, um, again, if I can be permitted to, if I can be permitted that category without having sort of fully delivered on it, um, I think the indeterminacy of it would be um, essential to the way in which it helps us mark out action versus behavior. Um, or what, you know, I like your phrase of, you know, we can be ready to do without knowing um, without having yet a full sense of what we are doing or what we will be doing. I mean, I think you're right. There's, uh, that's, there's, there's insight in that. Um, you know, if we pursue that line, then we have to pursue it in a way where um, we're not just opening up everything to indeterminacy. And I'm not suggesting you're doing that by any means, but that's, that's kind of the danger that lurks in the background is sort of once you um, or that's a danger that lurks in the background, I think, for many, many forms of pragmatism. You know, once you open the door a bit to indeterminacy, um, then pragmatism like, quickly gets sort of ushered, ushered along towards conceptions that make it more look like irrationalism. Um, and I think nothing, you know, I think that that's, that's clearly not what pragmatism wants to be. That's clearly not what pragmatists are aiming for. Um, but, um, there's, there's a way in which we, if, if pragmatism is going, yeah, going to accept indeterminacy, um, we need to also accept that we're going to be putting ourselves in a position where we're pushed toward that. Um, so, um, you know, when James makes room for and positively affirms the role of vagueness in our lives, and, you know, here I'm thinking of, um, William Gavin's wonderful book on James about the reinstatement of the Vega. This is just to me one of the, the best books on James in the last 20 years. Um, um, and it, you know, I don't think it's a it's a book that hasn't received the attention that it deserves. Um, but you know, making room for that vagueness in James, but making room for it in a way where it's philosophically productive and not just something that, you know, I worry the worry that I have is that, you know, we open the door to um, pushing James or pushing pragmatism more 
more down a path. And this, I think, is what Peirce was always worried about in James, um, a tendency for James to be pushed down a path where he ends up looking too much like Bergson or somebody like that, um, where he ends up in a view where it looks like he might be um, accusable of something like irrationalism. And we certainly see that in Rorty too. Um, so that, that for me is the challenge, is how to make room for that indeterminacy, but also place limits on it. Um, and you know that's, that's a challenge because indeterminacy is that which by definition doesn't want to be determined or you know, cannot be determined. Um, so how do we have um, a determinate conception of indeterminacy as it were? Um, so um, yeah, that's... I mean, I, yeah, thank I'll, you, thank I'm just going to stop there. That's no, that's very sure, important. because there are many other questions. Also, John has one. And also, uh, yes, we can collect the three last questions briefly. We have first uh, Professor Stewart, then Connor, and Christian. Good, let me see if I can get my video to hold. Um, Colin, thank you. Um, I appreciate your desire to avoid metaphysics. I think your notion of a method without metaphysics, metaphysics is itself a metaphysics. Um, I wanna ask you to say just a little bit more about your um, language experience and conduct mapping of pragmatism. Here, here's why that seems a little strange to me. It, it seems a little odd historically because the earlier figures use the term conduct. Peirce talks about concepts exiting through the gate of conduct. Dewey writes a book called Conduct and Human, you know, Human Nature and Conduct, right? And then in letters explains why he abandons that notion of conduct for the notion of experience in the next book, Experience in Nature, right? So that, that seems sort of odd to me. And plus, from a sort of conceptual standpoint, I, I wonder what you think experience is if it doesn't include conduct. What is a conduct-free notion of experience? I, I can't understand how any of the pragmatists could unpack a notion of experience without referring to conduct. But the, but the question that I really wanna kind of end up with is what I take to be the more pragmatic one, which is I think that if we're pragmatists here, instead of thinking, are there really three kinds of pragmatism or are there really two or are there really 14, right? The question should be, what's the use of distinguishing three, right? And so, because you focus on the political questions, I kind of want to ask you this way. If one thinks of pragmatism as conduct pragmatism, can you give an example of a political issue or political problem that conduct pragmatism approaches differently than say experience pragmatism does, right? The pragmatist would tell you if there's no practical difference, <laughs> they amount to the same. Right, so what, what is the pragmatic difference or the pragmatic advantage of conduct pragmatism? Thanks, John, that's, yeah, that's, that, is, that is the question. Um, so I'll, let me give an answer, um, um, which I hope will be the, the best kind of proof that there is a difference, proof by existence, though of course that depends on you all agreeing that there's value in the text that I'll name. Um, and I'll, let me just, if, if you want me to answer this again, I can, but let me go sort of where my mind first goes, which is not to a pragmatist, but to Foucault, who for arguments that I gave earlier, I think would be resonant that, you know, I think Foucault is primarily a philosopher of practices. Um, another example that I would hope to give here would be my own book, How We Became Our Data, but I don't, let me not go there. Let me go to Foucault, because it's gonna be more clear to everybody in the room. So take a book like Discipline and Punish, which, you know, if you all grant me, and so hearing though your questions, John, about my framing, the sort of triadic framing, but if you grant me that framing, um, you know, then the question we can ask is, is Foucault's discipline and punish primarily about the experiences of punishment and transformations in punishment from the late 18th to the mid 19th century? Is it primarily about the discourse around punishment in that transformative period? Or is it primarily about punitive practices in those periods. Um, and um, uh, Stefan, who I think had to drop out, sort of raised this question in the chat a little bit ago, um, you know, he framed it in terms of the priority of practices in Foucault's work. So, so I would make this the claim that, that um, 
um, the, the, the insight in or the value of Foucault's work in Discipline and Punish comes primarily from it being in analytics, uh, historical analyses of practices of punishment. That's not to say that there's no room in that book at all for experiences, but it's, it's clearly not a prominent role. I mean, Foucault's not prominently in that book as it were sort of lifting up the experience of those who came to be um, caught up in this new regime of imprisonment. Um, I think that's in view for him for sure, especially with his work with the prison information group. Um, and it's also not a book, and this is probably the more important point to make, it's not a book primarily about um, criminological, what would come to be called criminological discourse or discourse around punishment. Um, and here's the quickest way to make that point. There's obviously a longer argument to be had here. When Foucault cites Bentham in Discipline and Punish, he doesn't cite the author of the principles of morals and legislation. He cites this humble, tinkering technician, Jeremy Bentham, who came up with this diagram for the Panopticon. Um, and it's, so it's not a theoretical argument. He's not interested in Bentham, the author of, a philosophical treatise. He's not interested in Bentham in terms of his discursive elaboration. He's in, interested in Bentham as an engineer, um, as somebody who helped put into motion um, certain um, style, a certain regime of punishment that would then come to be in part implemented in practice. Um, so that's, that's to say that the focus there then is not entirely on the discursive and I take the crux of the focus and that doesn't, you know, of course discourse is going to be part of it. That's why conduct for me needs to pull in discourse and experience um, and not, you know, but not subsume them entirely. Um, but the focus is on practices. The focus is on, is on practices of punishment. You know, what's done to the, the bodies, but especially the actions of those who come to be imprisoned or what's done to the bodies of those who in the prior regime are tortured. Um, so, um, so I take, you know, I take that to be a story about what's valuable in this practice because then we get what's valuable in this, this, this sort of methodological approach of a practice first methodology because then we get simultaneously a more capacious methodology where you know, we can find in Foucault both an attentiveness to what gets said, but also an attentiveness to something that hasn't been prominent in the history of political philosophy, the technologies by which political regimes are actually implemented. Um, like what does this actually look, you know, here's what Bentham may have said about it, or here's what uh, Beccaria may have said about it, but here's what it actually looks like in terms of its implementation in human practice. Um, so we get that breadth and that capaciousness. We also get an openness. And this is going back to some of what Saren was asking about. Um, we get an openness to a kind of transformability. Um, and so far as there's a normative dimension to the story, we're not stuck, as Saren was mentioning, um, with, um, we're not stuck looking for certainty. Um, um, and we get, um, I, I think this, you know, above all, we get an attentiveness to how that, that point about uncertainty, that, sorry, that point about certainty is important because then we can give an analysis of political practices that doesn't rely on a foundationalist conception of reality, which I take it pragmatism is, um, aims to, to kind of wean us off of the history of that in um, Western philosophy. Um, so in other words, you know, we get an analysis of politics that doesn't take, and Saren was, was mentioning this as well, and I, it's, I don't take this to be an innocent move, but we get a conception of politics where reality is present, but reality features as a dimension of our practices. Um, and that's, that might sound counterintuitive, but that's really only counterintuitive to a certain brand of realism. Um, one way to make this point is um, by way of, again, I keep referring to Foucault here, um, but Foucault's only advisee was the historian and philosopher of medicine, um, Francois Delaporte, who in this magnificent book from 1986, Disease and Civilization, which I recommend to anybody today who's interested in disease, which I take that to be anybody, um, writes on uh, page six of the, the first chapter of the book, what does exist is not disease, but practices. What does exist is not disease, but practices. Um, so in other words, if we take that practice-centric approach, then 
of course, disease exists as a feature of or as an element within a practice. I mean, Delaporte is not making the outrageous claim that there are no diseases. Rather, the claim is that diseases feature, diseases have significance, diseases are elements within repertoires of human engagement only within the context of practices. Um, so that doesn't mean, by the way, that diseases didn't um, eat away at people's lives before there were conceptions of diseases or practices of medicine. Um, but those people didn't engage with those diseases as diseases. Something else was eating away at their life. Um, and, um, so, um, so that's yeah. So that's that's hopefully um, in, in terms of how it approaches politics differently. I think that that Foucauldian approach for me is kind of a good example of that. Um, and I'll, one thing I'll add to that, and I kind of mentioned this in the talk, is. Part of the value of that for me is it finally gets us away from the tendency, which I take to just be rampant across political philosophy, less so in theoretical wings of political science, but this rampant tendency to engage with politics through the lens of, of a dialectical analysis, as if there are true oppositions or contradictions in political life. Um, you know, and I don't need to kind of give a caricature of Marx to, to make this story, but everybody's familiar um, you know, with, with those kinds of analyses. And I think that a practice-based analysis enables us to see the, the complexity of political reality. It enables us to see the complexity of these political, transformable, dynamic orders that we're in, um, such that we don't need to reduce them down to categories like, um, you know, bourgeoisie and proletariat, which are meant to stand in strict opposition, as if there's like, is it, you know, it's not clear to me from a pragmatist perspective that there's an opposition there. Yes, there are tensions, there are conflicts, but is opposition really a rich enough category? Does that really speak to the political complexity of the situations we find ourselves in? Um, I'm, obviously, I'm, my answer to that question is no. Um, so let me let me stop there. But yeah, it gives us it trains us on the complexity, the contingency, the transformability, all without sort of a nod to foundations. But it still gives us something to hold on to. It's not just swiping away foundations and then there's nothing left, then I think the idea is we swipe away foundations and practices gives us a way in to looking at these complex contingencies. Um, let me stop there just because I know there are other questions, but um, I also appreciate your questions, John, about method and metaphysics and um, the history of experience language conduct. I do agree with you about the, the historical story there. And I think it is an odd story that I'm telling. And that's, that's part of my point. Like why did, why have we lost sense of the centrality of conduct in the early James? Like, why isn't that more prominent in contemporary pragmatism scholarship? Um, and, you know, if I guess if somebody could sort of come along and show me, well, it is more prominent than I'm, then great. You know, then that's the philosophical story I want. And then maybe I need to scrap the history or something. Oh, we have time for two brief last questions from Connor and Christian. Yeah, let me say I we I do need to keep it brief because I'm supposed to jump off at 10 because I have a dis normally I would be but I have a dissertation defense actually. I, I'll I'll try and I'll try and keep it brief then in that case. So I wanted to crack back onto something that uh Saren mentioned in his response, which I thought was really cool, was focusing these sorts of philosophical accounts that we're gonna give of language, experience, conduct, whatever, in terms of, say, funneling them towards eventual political action, say, or political discourse. That seems really pressing to me, right? But so I get the feeling that in the conduct pragmatism stuff, and uh, Saren kind of mentioned it, the idea that we could have a quietist option. So I'm really tempted by quietism, like all the time, because I think that there is a serious issue with, I mean, you see all sorts of like, <laughs> metaphysics has some pretty deleterious political effects. I mean, philosophers aren't the only ones with metaphysical categories. Uh, you look at, say, like the debate of uh, in the UK with like trans people and their kind of resurgence of a kind of trans exclusionary feminism that's rooted in biological determinism. Uh, and the exclusions of all sorts of, you know, any kind of nuance in what we talk. That's, I mean, that's a metaphysical position that we might have. But so I was thinking about the quietism thing and a sort of a, a, a metaphor uh, came to mind, right? So quietist, the quietist is someone who fires their gardener, right? 
and then expects the ground to stay clear. But it doesn't. If you fire your gardener, you end up with brambles and pickets and all sorts of nasty things growing, right? So I guess the metaphor is, and we see it like in, in Ireland, for instance, we've had a, a lot of negative political uh, stuff coming up uh, as, a, as a kind of a response to or in the absence of any sort of serious discourse in politics with, or discourse with any serious nuance. We have people developing or we have metaphysical categories, kinds, concepts that sort of develop in the absence of serious criticism. So, I mean, surely the point of doing the non-quietist stuff, it isn't to fix certain categories. It's to make sure that we have empirical focus where we need it. And that's really what I take to be Dewey's point in the first chapter of experience in nature and the kind of empirical naturalism. And like, the fact, it's, it's a point worth mentioning and repeating. The final chapter of experience in nature isn't just another claim about metaphysics. It's a claim about the focus of metaphysics and naturalistic metaphysics. It's supposed to be directed towards getting sharp on our empirical categories and our empirical problems so that we can actually kind of do something about them, right? So yeah, I mean, I may, I maybe uh, I'd love to hear more about the quietest thing insofar as it's a, a quick and easy question to answer. All right, but thanks, it was a cool talk. Oh yeah, and John Stewart, you're really cool. Uh, I never got to meet you in person, but I, th I love your work. Yeah, Connor, I'll, I'll just, a quick response is, I, I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I find quietism tempting, but I don't myself, I'm not inclined to go there um, because I think you're right. It's sort of letting go of some of the questions that we ought to expect ourselves as philosophers to engage. Um, that said, you know, I think quietism rightly quiets down as it were metaphysical ambition. So I think the way this is why I would hold on to the methodological metaphysical distinction that I that I want, um, because I think you know Sarn offered as the alternative to quietism the substantive option and analysis of what conduct is. I think that we're you know my view requires of me to do that. My review requires of me to engage in that substantive option. The question is, do I engage in it methodolog methodologically or metaphysically? And I want to say engage in it methodologically, where the question becomes actually John's question, which is. Well, what difference does it make? Show me how this actually pays off in um, some form of political inquiry or other. And I think I can do that. I can, you know, one hope one hopes that one can sort of show a payoff over here without making the sort of puffed up claim that, well, it, it's always going to pay off in all instances and in all times, which is I take it sort of more the kind of metaphysical bravado. If you want a metaphysics that has sort of drained of the bravado, then I'm all for it. Um, because then you have a metaphysics where philosophers can't come along to one another and say, oh, you have to be doing metaphysics because there's, you know, there's no, there's nothing to sort of thump one another with the head, over the head with. Um, so, um, and Christian, I noticed you, you had a question too, and, and I should probably try to jump here so I'm not late to this defense. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very briefly, um, I had a question about what you call the uh, free value logic of a uh, pragmatist uh, political theory. Uh, in your account, uh, what is uh, really characteristic of uh, pragmatist politics, um, it seems to me, is the third element, what you call the, uh, the doubtful or the problematic. But do you think there is uh, still place for the other two values, for the true and the false? Uh, from a pragmatist uh, standpoint. I think, for instance, of uh, contemporary theorists influenced by, uh, by Dewey, like uh, uh, Bruno Latour or uh, Norti Mares, which tend to define the public in uh, this sense as an intrinsically problematic uh, community, so that, uh, in a sense, we are in a political, sp political space only while we are confronting uh, something that is, that is uh, problematic. Uh, while the, uh, the alternative between uh, truth and falsity comes in only at the end of uh, the process. So it's not, uh, the, it's not politics in a sense, uh, the process itself of defining what is uh, true of, and the uh, force of contending over, the, over truth and falsity. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, yeah, there needs to be space for that within pragmatism. Yeah, and I appreciate your nod to Norcia Maris's work, which um, I'm, yeah, I, I love her work in the way that she picks up on the conception of pragmatism and runs with it in the STS literature. Um, so, you know, all I want to make room for is that, again, that counter movement where we go from determinate to indeterminate. And I think there's a role for philosophy in that as well, that sort of 
again, that sort of denaturalizing move or that move that makes us want to be more reflective and more questioning. Um, and, you know, that's not a once and for all about everything. That's not like Cartesian skepticism or something. That's rather like pointed focused skepticism, you know, we're, we're picking up from Connor. That's like an empirically trained skepticism, like skepticism for these reasons. Like we're not skepticism of prisons just because, because we want to be, we're skeptical of prisons, like, you know, in this context for these reasons, you know, because of the racialized dimension of imprisonment in my country, right? Um, that's why there's skepticism around imprisonment as a regime. Um, but that's an empirically trained skepticism. That's a skepticism that's funded by beliefs, which are themselves either true or false. So, um, so yeah, if I, if I hear your point correctly, I, I'm fully on board with that, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just a little reminder. So the next session will be on the 24th of March uh, with uh, Professor, Professor Kate Robinson on abstract light uh, between Deleuze, White, and Bergson. And thank you very much, you all. Thank you, Colin. It was a wonderful, uh, very nice uh, discussion and uh, so many uh, different inspirations for us. Uh, perfect talk. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Thank you Rosella. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank, Thank you, you, Saren. Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao a tutti. Arrivederci. Take it easy, guys. Bye. Thank you. Ciao, Saren. Ciao, Saren. Grazie. Grazie a voi. Alla prossima. Buona serata. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.